think Lenny was? Lenny was the greatest entertainer who ever lived. He was the greatest entertainer who ever lived. And I mean that in the broadest possible sense of that word because a real entertainer looks you right in the eye and engages you and says, listen to what I have to say. The first thing that comes to mind is how much larger than life he was. I've never met anybody quite I've met larger than life people, not Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein. Lenny Bernstein. Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein. 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 Leonard Bernstein was one of the most vastly gifted, vastly known, and vastly influential musicians in the history of classical music. A pianist who conducted from the piano, a channeler of great composers, and an all round mensch who wasn't simply great who was cool, who was no more a conductor of music than a conductor of lightning, a transmitter of love and passion and heat and brashness and no-handed glory, who, for all his titanic achievements, was at his core a teacher. Bernstein taught mid-century people to understand music the way Hitchcock taught them to understand images. When he showed an early interest in music, his father discouraged him. When asked about this later, his father said, how could I know he'd turn out to be Leonard Bernstein? Bernstein was a Jewish kid from the Bronx. When his aunt left the house a piano, he learnt it, and by 18, he was studying music at Harvard. Then came the Curtis Institute of Music, then the New York Phil, where in 43, a guest conductor got the flu, Bernstein got his break, and the rest is history. After World War II, many young Jews who'd go on to make it in America changed their names. Kids like Ralph Lifshitz, the sons of immigrants who'd go on to sell American culture to Americans. Bernstein's mentor, Serge Kuzovitsky, encouraged him to do the same. I've decided to make it as Leonard Bernstein or not at all. And he did, redefining, alongside Jewish contemporaries like Gershwin, Copland and Sondheim, the meaning of American music. Cementing music's place among the contemporary theatrical arts. It is true that my music is theatre oriented, all of it is. But I don't see anything particularly demeaning about that because the theatre is a great place. Bernstein celebrated the dispersion of musical taste in 20th century America. Specifically, the fact that he and Duke Ellington we share the same audiences to a much greater extent than we used to. A cultural expansion which... Some dismay uh, among the higher brow critics. <clears throat> but uh, it's a thing that I am very proud of and happy to see happening and was happy to contribute to. I like to be in America. He simply loved music because he loved humanity entirely. He wore it right on his sleeve. He just, that was it. I'm music. I love music. That's it. He injected humanism into his own work. In rehearsing Stravinsky's The Ride of Spring, Bernstein chided his players for being so well raised that they'd forgotten the aggressive filthiness of our origins. I think you're all too well mannered. Ah, really bestial. I mean, this is beastly music brought to the highest, most refined point. Bernstein infiltrated the plush world of classical music and forced it to reflect ours. That's right. It's primeval, primordial, whatever you want to call it. If a sound wasn't true, Bernstein would hunt it and kill it. No one could conceal mistakes, not even behind the podium of leadership. I was a young conductor too, so I can speak from experience that there are times when you get confused or lost, or you're not sure if it's the first time or the second time, or is this the G major one or the B flat. We all get it, we kids down here. No, no, when I'm excited. We know when you're bullshit, I... yes. I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bernstein's right. sense of truth and of timing made him a tough teacher. You're ahead of me. You can see the fear on this poor guy's face. And he was but one of a number of victims. I don't know how to tell you to do it, but do it! It was in Bernstein's nature to mine people because it was in his nature to mine himself. Despite producing 107 major compositions by the end of his life, he lamented the fact that he didn't make more. Actually, I have written a very small body of music. And since writing music is the most important thing I can do, the main dissatisfaction is therefore that I have written so little 
music. This dissatisfaction is intrinsic to many creative people, but it's also a product of one's environment. Bernstein advocated for stern teachers because he had them as a student. I had a drink one day with Walter when the day was done, and he was crying. He said, I don't know what to do. I can't stand it. And I said, I know, I can't stand it either, but you just have to do it. You, you have to suffer this man's standards because that's what we're learning. As a student, Bernstein regularly came under J.K. Simmons and whiplash level scrutiny. For the final father fucking time, say it louder! I'm upset! But as a teacher, he was always forgivable because there was never any malice. Sure, he embarrassed people but it was all in the name of good music and listening to the truth. I'm very happy I studied with Ben Gerola. She was a tyrant and she taught me to listen. The first year was hell with her. I was so shaking and frightened that I could barely play. And the second year I realized that she was a great lady and that she loved me enough to be tyrannical. Bernstein constantly sought new people to enrich his life. He recognised that America was a place for foreign artists and scientists and thinkers who have come not only to visit us but often to join us as Americans. Whether it was a new talent, a new tool or a new teaching, Bernstein was born to share. He taught us the history of conducting, a history which, as we understand it, is less than 150 years old. Well, the first real conductor in our sense of the word was the composer Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn dedicated himself to an exact realization of the score he was conducting through manipulation of this baton. There soon arrived, however, a great dissenter named Richard Wagner who declared that everything Mendelssohn was doing was all wrong and that any conductor worth his salt should be able to personalize the score he was conducting by colouring it with his own emotions and his own creative impulse. If Mendelssohn fathered the elegant Apollonian school of conducting and Wagner begat the passionate Dionysian school of conducting, Bernstein combined the two, acknowledging that both these attitudes are necessary and neither one is completely satisfactory without the other. Bernstein accepted the ambiguity of sheet music and emphasized the conductor's responsibility to his own perception. A conductor takes the material at hand and applies his taste, much like a filmmaker adapting a novel or a stage director interpreting a page of Shakespeare who was equally uninformative. Bach, in his Keyboard Concerto 1 in D minor, is anything but generous in the instructions he gives about how to interpret the work. We are told what instruments are playing, like a dramatis personae, and we are told what notes they play. But besides that, there's nothing but a pitifully few clues to performance. So Bernstein, to teach interpretation to his early TV audience, plays the concerto twice. First, with no dramatic variety. And second by mirroring its rise and fall with analogous rises and falls of volume, like this. The resulting sounds are a credit to Bernstein and Bach. To Bach for having the trust and courage to facilitate interpretation, and to Bernstein for honouring that trust. And in turn, trusting a 28-year-old Glenn Gould to perform the work based on his own judgments, instincts, and highly individual personality. For Bernstein, an interpreter divines from a thing's physical factors its intangible meaning. A task in which one must study the whole work, get to know its insides, and then draw our conclusions. His broadcasts were digestible because he wanted to inspire everyone. He believed that almost any musician can be a conductor and in fact a pretty good one. A great conductor, like a great director, architect, executive or writer, is a generalist, one who understands the technical but won't be its slave. I have no idea what I do on the podium. I don't prepare a gesture. And blast off. Bernstein's aversion to formalism led him to the new, and in 69 he became one of the first mass exhibitors of digital music, presenting Bach's little fugue on an organ, then sharing a transmogrification of the same fugue again, but on the much talked and written about Moog synthesizer. Bernstein wasn't motivated by money. I signed contracts without reading them. 
I have no interest in that really? aspect of life. He was, however, socially motivated. You know what I enjoyed most about being a celebrity? That people asked for me to give my name to causes. In Moscow, he played for a Russian physical audience and an American TV audience the entire first movement of Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony. A work written in 1941, the first year of the war, and dedicated to Shostakovich's beloved and besieged city of Leningrad. Bernstein was moved by the event and spoke like a true and perhaps naive, but totally unjaded idealist. Instead of wasting our energies in hostility and our wealth on weaponry, we could send art to the moon, exalt our Pasternaks instead of isolating them, harness the sun's energy, learn a few languages, talk, travel, grow, and love. And this, love, is Bernstein's legacy. Love expressed sternly, clearly, and sometimes angrily, that always wants the best for its object, that accepts excellence as its minimum standard, that celebrates beauty, truth, and as the Jews say, Chaim itself. That's what I live for. People, age, relationships, and spreading love. And my way of doing that uh, is through music through writing music and playing music and talking about music and teaching young people. At the end of his life, music wasn't what Bernstein was most proud of. The only thing I'm really proud of in my life is that all these conductors were my friends. And so this video is made in that spirit, in the spirit of love, of teaching, of excellence, and of urging people to do beautiful things. Because we need more Bernstein. People who love the work and those doing it, who chase excellence, who expect more of themselves, not less, and who channel the divine the way Bernstein conducted Mahler, a composer he loved so much that he was buried with the score to Mahler 5 laid across his heart, leaving us, but leaving us with his work, the sound of life and death, the sound of a maestro.